Hi, I'm Nalini Haynes and this is Dark Magazine. Today I'm talking to Kathleen O'Shaughnessy who has reviewed books for The Guardian, The Telegraph, The Times, Financial Times, Independent, The Observer, TLS, New Statesman, The Spectator and others. The list goes on. She's worked as Deputy Editor on the Literary Review, Arts and Books Editor of Vogue, Literary Editor of the European and Deputy Editor of the Telegraph, Arts and Books. Yeah. Her stories have been published in Fav Faber's First Fictions and she edited and introduced Drago Stambuck's poems, Incompatible Animals. And today we're here to talk about her book, in love with George Eliot. Welcome, Kathy O'Shaughnessy. Thank you. I'm very glad to be here. When did you fall in love with George Eliot? I think I fell in love with George Eliot. Well, I know I fell in love with George Eliot, really, when I was a teenager. And in the book we're talking about, there's a meta thread um, which has one autobiographical element and and that is there's an episode I recount when I'm a broken-hearted teenager having split up with my boyfriend and utterly miserable and I think I'll sort of cheer myself up by going to see this older male friend who's at the glamorous Cambridge University and I go and um, it's sort of grim it all everything starts to seem grimmer and he starts to make horrible comments about his ex-girlfriend and the world just seems a very dark place and I at that time in my life, which was a sort of terrible time, as only teenage breakups can be in a way, I, Middlemarch really was my consoling comfort. And there's something about her voice that just kept me company and made me feel it's, it's human to suffer, others are with you and it will pass. And I felt understood. It was almost like therapy before therapy except better than that because it's art as well yes well bibliotherapy is a thing where you you read books to like give yourself therapy or you read books to trial out new roles <coughs> and new and to explore feelings so i think as much as anything um the fact that you can turn to middle march and see it like that is a reflection of the brilliance of the book and the skill of the author in tapping into the human condition. Definitely. And I think the thing about George Eliot is that her characters are so psychologically convincing and so alive. And she is so good at bringing the sort of good and bad of us all into one place to which we can all relate that you, you live through these experiences that she writes about. I sort of think of it actually as a kind of proxy living. And I also think this was one of her really big missions as an author was to um, enable us to feel for others and understand others. And because in real life, we only have our own consciousness and however much we talk to someone else, we don't know what it's like to be in that other person's head. And I think her her sort of it, her mission in the deepest sense was to help us understand, enable us to understand others by living their life, as it were, fictionally. It's a sort of magic thing that fiction could do. And I, just remembering that George Eliot is writing at the time when, in the 19th century, mid 19th century England, and there are secular rumbles everywhere she had renounced religion when she was i think age 19 and her father had threatened her with ejection from where she was living and everything it was a very controversial and bold thing for her to do in fact um but so it it, it meant for a lot of people a world of growing uncertainty and i i think this thing about understanding others and helping a sort of humanism was her ultimate response to that secular situation where a lot of people felt marooned and uncertain. You, you talk about that in the book. You talk about how her father threatened her and in the end they reached a compromise. That's right. She could think 
she could would go to church with him on a Sunday and therefore not shame him publicly. Um, but she could think her own thoughts. At least I think that's how I put it. So, yeah. I'm, I'm fascinated about your discussion of George Eliot. Um, you, you have two story threads in the novel. Um, one is George Eliot as a person um, and, and an author in the 19th century, and the other is a more contemporary uh, person in academia, um, Kathy Boyd, I think you call her. It's Kate Boyd. Yes, um, and, and you have the, the two, while, while George Eliot uh, dominates by far the novel, you do have the two threads. And, and you use this as a vehicle for discussing Eliot as a person, her views, her political views, her feminist view, well, views on feminism, views on women. Um, I found mm. that really fascinating. W would you like to talk a bit about that? Yeah, I mean, I wanted to have, I think, George Eliot, she's this 19th century author and she often, um, she can look as if she's from this different time world, which she is, I suppose. Um, I wanted to have the sound of, contemporary reaction a bit to her especially in terms of women's reaction to her because she was so contradictory and interesting about women and um she as 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 i as the novel um shows she she did this extraordinarily bold thing in her life which was to openly live with a married man the married man had separated from his wife, but he couldn't legally get a divorce. Um, but George Eliot chose to live with him. And the thing is, is that in Victorian London or England, many married people had affairs, but you were you were discreet. And she really broke them all by choosing on principle to be open about it because, because she and Lewis, George Lewis was his name, loved each other. And... Um, it seemed a morally fine thing to do and she was going to do it, but she paid a price because she was sort of overnight a disgraced figure and very notorious. A fallen woman. She was, she was as it were living in sin with Lewis. Um, and but then in this, and in this way, her story is quite like a fairy tale at this point. Um, from this reclusive rather hidden life that she was obliged to lead with Lewis. He could go out to the clubs and drinking places in London, but she really couldn't. There was a ferocious double standard in operation. Um, she, she began to write her magnificent fiction. And of course, one of the things that distinguishes her fiction is this great deep moral vision that somehow appeals to our sympathies and our experiences. And, um, and so, by the time she writes Adam Bede, her fame is completely taking off and um, everyone is saying, who is George Eliot? Because that was her pseudonym. And gradually she was outed and so gradually she did claim the prize or the throne or acknowledge herself and gradually society forgave her. In, in a sense, it was an incredible feminist move, this this boldness in living openly with Lewis. Um, and for that reason, the progressive women of her time adored her. Well, that reason and her writing, you know, it's fantastic, sort of both counts. So, um, so they were immediately, in a sense, her tribe, if you like. Um, I mean, that might be a wrong description, but at any rate, certainly she was a figure of fascination. And she had great feminist friends like Barbara, um, Barbara Bodichon, who went on to, along with Emily Davies, found the first university college for women. All these huge, important changes were happening. And it was very much a matter of debate, the whole sort of the women yeah. issue. But George Eliot, she was right behind um, Barbara Bodichon in terms of thinking education for women was a good thing. And she also thought 
men were very prejudiced in their expectations that this would make women less attractive. You know, almost kind of, you have to get through dull conversations instead of pretty, and pretty things would happen less. And, but um, a lot of her thoughts also were, you know, were quite conservative. So she wasn't particularly pro women getting the vote. And um, she really did see women in women and men in many ways as in quite an essentialist way as um, the women providing being nurturers and having this as she says in De Daniel Deronda I think you know this treasure of affection that they carry forth and she didn't denigrate that as something less she didn't patronize it she thought it was unbelievably important but of course, it's it's a difficult position to take from her position because she didn't have children. And, and I think she couldn't have really, because by the time she started living with Lewis, he had three children of his own. Yeah. And, um, and also her position would have made it, you know, even more sort of cause for comment. So, but I, I'm also not at all convinced she wanted children and, and she was this great achiever who would have been um, not happy if she hadn't achieved. And she talks about her own fastidious and hungry ambition. And I think she was unbelievably ambitious. I, I really do. There's something she writes before she's come near the Westminster Review, London, journalism or writing. Um, it's a great quote just about wanting to understand things and she had a natural radicalism as well and that comes out in that quote which I wish I could remember it but it's something like um, I aspire to unclothe everything around me of its conventional human temporary dress you go there in the book you talk about those passages in the book yeah yeah I, I can't help but wondering um, Elliot seems to almost have Stockholm syndrome in that she's participating in her own oppression and, and the oppression of other women. Um, yeah. like, like those contemporary, notorious right-wing women these days who see themselves as exceptions to the rule while they're advocating the suppression and oppression of others. Is this kind of, was this your intent or have I misinterpreted the way you've portrayed her? Well, you know, I think, I think, I don't, there isn't an easy answer to this. I think that, I think that Elliot was a complicated person. I came to feel personally that she had some unease about her own mighty ambitiousness. And don't forget, she felt herself, she wasn't, she wasn't pretty. She was in fact famously ugly. And I think it was a huge sort of grief for her when she was younger. She, she used to write even in her teens, you know, I, I'm, I will never probably fight, no one will ever love me. I think she had this terror. She was someone who needed love a lot. Uh, <laughs> and Lewis was an amazing, you know, if not legal, but an amazing husband to her. But, um, I, I suppose, I mean, I, I know it doesn't fit our bill of what a feminist should be, but the fact is, just by example, she did a formidable thing for women, I think, just by having, it's really hard for us to appreciate how courageous she would have had to be to have taken that step. And, and you know, that that thing of being of having other women feel possibly morally superior to you and contemptuous of you, I, I'm sure was incredibly painful for her actually, for all her bravery. And I, I think, I think she was the giant exception and you sort of feel, hey, it's all very well for you. You know, what about all these other women? I, I did feel, I did feel that. But I also think that it is a strength in her that she could see the mixed picture, which is that women do do some things. I mean, I think women have got something a bit special to give in the way of affection, but I, I don't know if that's, that's probably a sort of controversial thing to say, but I, 
I'm a mother. I I think I think that women talk to each other differently. I'm not saying some of this, a lot of this, isn't culturally mm-hmm. a cultural and ultimately, but the fact is, women talk much more intimately and readily with each other than men. You know, I think the cultures are different, and I she had these great close women friendships where. A great, great deal of confessional, close, sympathetic talk went on. I don't know if I'm answering your question very well. I, I think there isn't an easy resolution to this one about her feminism. It's one thing I did end up feeling, though, is that she, I admired her courage in not um, having to think like other people. And I think that was the courage that enabled her to be such a bold woman in the first place. Well, I, I just think she's magnificent. You know, she's so thoughtful, so mm. questing, so keen to know, to understand as much as possible. And when I wrote that, the chapter sort of leading up to the writing of Middlemarch, when um, Lewis peeks into her notebooks um, and sees the sort of extent and breadth and range of what she's doing, I was trying to convey my own I was so thrilled at looking at this. It's a rather strange book I got out of the London Library that had in sort of small, odd, not proper kind of printed. It looks like typewritten, reproduced, tiny typewritten. It, it's a curious looking old book. And, and here are her thoughts that just span everything from sort of the distance of the moon to the earth. You know, again, her her huge ambitiousness and... Um, dipping into the ancient past and, um, you know, traditions, rituals, the weight of Dante's brain. I mean, extraordinary miscellany of facts and um, pieces of literary quotation that interested her from so many different cultures, so many different ages. So that that range and scope and that inquiring um, drive of hers, I just think that was terrific and I wanted to get some of that thrill into that into my book I think you succeeded oh I just couldn't help wondering how many languages you speak because you just casually throw in a bit of German and a bit of Italian and you know so I was I was just wondering if you follow in Elliot's footsteps you know, that is one of the things. She's like a constant reproach to me because I don't. I speak, you know, I can speak French and I can say a few, say a bit. I can speak a very, very poor pidgin Italian, but very poor. And that really is about it. And no, I, she, I think I aspire. I aspire to be like her and also to, to begin to have a mind as well stocked as hers, which I certainly don't. Um, but I, I love her drive and application. It, she's an absolute inspiration to women, I think. As, I mean, at the time, a lot of people felt she was like a man's mind and a woman's mind, both. Because she was, it's quite rare to find a great novelist who's also a really, really formidable intellectual in the way that she was. It's rare to find that among men. So like the great classicists of her age, would meet her and find that she could absolutely equal them to any sort of Greek or Latin poetry. And and like someone who was very naturally versed in it, not like, as they put it, I'm afraid, like women who had to show off a smaller part of learning. But her, she had the great ease that comes with really having studied and thought. She wasn't parroting. She was immersed she really was and she'd studied and just as she learnt, started to learn ancient Hebrew when she um, was writing Daniel Deronda and um, Daniel Deronda is a fascinating book. I don't know if you know it, but it, it, is, it includes her whole quest to sort of make us sympathetic, to overcome anti-Semitic prejudice, really. I confess I haven't read it. I don't think I've read it. And um, I think we need more of those kinds of books these days. Absolutely. And I think there's a real, there's a, to me, there's a great kind of political dimension that's implicit 
in her um, her mission to take us into other people's experiences, however different. You know, so she wrote about working people when it wasn't usual to write really sort of seriously and take really take different experiences seriously. Um, but that that um, art of hers, whereby one can you know, like almost with a magic ticket experience, another person's experience has never been more important in our politically divided, crazy world, apparently. So we need more empathy, more communication, like real communication, not just talking at people. I couldn't agree more. We in Britain are not having an easy time of it. Well, God knows. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, I'm wondering how much, like, you have called this um, In Love with George Eliot a novel. Mm. How much of the book is fact and how much is fiction? Now, I noted in your author's notes, you specifically stated that John Cross was present, like, in the novel, you stated that yeah. John Cross was present when Eliot's stepson, Thorny, was having some kind of episode on the floor but in real life John Cross wasn't there although the other events happened now why did you add him into that scene and and where did you draw the line between trying to be excruciatingly factual and delving into fiction Okay, that's a very good question. I think, first and foremost, I wanted it to work as a novel in the sense that I wanted a reader to be carried by the experiences and to feel they were living it as much as possible. Um, secondly, definitely every letter and diary quote, as I have got in the text, is real. So all, so the, all the bits in italics? I, it probably is pretty much, yeah. isn't it? I think it is. That's probably a good way of distinguishing them. Yes, that they're, they're all. So, for instance, all the Edith Simcox mm. diary notations are absolutely real. And um, yeah, all those. So those quotations are all real. And by and large, I stuck very closely to the sort of well, certainly in terms of time and in terms of events, and then. There were times where I I had to take a bit of license because it had to work as a novel. Now, the Johnny Cross was just a piece of sheer opportunism on my part because it was such... Henry James was there and he described the, the incident of seeing this boy on the floor, thorny and everything. And it was a key to me to, to show this kind of a woman's experience actually of stepmothering coming between herself and writing Middlemarch, which all seemed very germane to what Middlemarch itself is about in terms of what do women want to do with their lives really. So I so I wanted to get Thorny in I wanted to get Thorny in. It seemed irresistible to have Henry James on this fantastic first meeting of um, with George Eliot, it's a famous meeting, not not to put it in there. And Henry James and Johnny Cross did, um, w were not great friends, but they were friends a bit. Um, and so I, it was just when I'd introduced Johnny Cross, he needed to be, start, he, I, we needed to have a feeling for him. He needed to be there in the book. So I, I put him in there so he could be the eyewitness of the Henry James and George Eliot meeting. And he had just met them for real, um, probably only about six weeks before in Rome. So I didn't, it, it, it felt all right in terms of sticking close, if you see what I mean, but it was a liberty I took. But because it was a particularly, because the incident with James is quite known and everything, I wanted to draw attention to it in my notes at the back mm. but it's a very tricky business the fact fiction thing but I, I actually enjoyed it because because for me the subject was so fascinating that it I would have felt it a great pity to leave to have it all my invent my take on her because her own 
stuff is so interesting. So in this instance, I just thought, damn it, we'll just combine or make it both. And so for me, it was also an inquiry into her to try and understand her as closely as I could. Mm. On that note, and kind of veering away from my notes now, um, I found it fascinating that at the end, you're talking about how Edith Simcox wanted to write a biography of George Eliot, and yet she was told not to, and so she didn't. And the biography that was proposed is not, I don't know if it was ever finished, but obviously, I mean, you don't cite it in your notes and you've, you've got quite a, quite a list in your bibliography. Um, and I'm just wondering if... Okay, so the thing is, is Simcox was, was, an, was an intellectual and in a, in a way much more on... Eliot's wavelength, um, but Cross, but Cross um, saw it as his kind of task to um, write almost like the authorized account of this, because by then her status was so sort of almost, you know, she was practically canonized. Um, and revered, you know, so, and, and it was very much in that spirit, I think, that he undertook the task, but what he did was, which I think I do, I, it's not really called a biography. What it is is, I, I, I'm not, I'm not even sure what it's called, but it is, it's Cross's account of her life in three volumes, and really he did a sort of characteristically Cross-like, super modest job, hardly putting himself in. Really, he sort of stitched her, her diary and letter accounts together with small interpolations of explanations of what was going on. Um, you know, it was a very courteously done, um, but I, I think he also took out anything that wasn't, that didn't fit a bit with the saintly idea. So that kind of, uh, so when it came out, I think it was about 1885, five years after she died, Wilfred Hale White wrote a well-known letter saying that he um, missed the salt and spice of this unusual woman, you know, and he, he, uh, and her, and her radicalism in her, not exactly cheekiness, but her ability to question everything um, and her sheer sort of being interested in everything somehow was second place to this image of goodness. Um, so he, he did give his, he did give his account and yeah, Simcox, well, she did. She, she, it's true that shortly after Elliot's death, she, she set off to go and sort of talk to everybody and take notes. Well, the only thing that I can say about that is that luckily we've got Edith Simcox's um, extraordinary diary, autobiography of a shirt maker. And, um, it, it, you know, her her experiences of these people who fe feature early in Eliot's life and and her own personal experiences are all there, very, very, very fervently, you know, written in fervent, clear detail. And she's en enormously articulate. Um, I think Cross just was the standard bearer as the widow. I think he felt obliged and in the end she conceded that to him. Mm. And in a sense, because he did it, in such a sort of backseated way, very much putting mostly her words together. I think even those who'd been worried about him doing it were, were kind of mildly relieved, really, and mildly pleased. When you say people were worried about him doing it, um, are you referring to his instability that you write about in the towards the end of the book? No, and I'm probably exaggerating when I say worried. I just think there were people, I think Barbara Baudichon, I'd have, I'd, I'd need to double check that, but I think various um, friends, because Edith Simcox gradually came to know a lot of the close friends of George Eliot, like Maria Congreve and Barbara Baudichon, ironically a bit, a lot after her death. And maybe it was, maybe it was those people who said, 
you know, you you should, because she was much more of an intellectual. Mm. Um, so, yeah, maybe it was just, it was more that. You talk about Johnny Cross um, tearing out pages from George Eliot's diary and burning them one by one. Did he really do that? And did he, like, destroy everything? <laughs> No, no. I mean, I, I thought once again that's a mixture of fictive license and truth. I, 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 I found that a very kind of weirdly funny scene to him tearing out these. And and the thing about Cross, I, I kind of instinctively sensed him as someone who was a bit shockable. You know, who had quite a conventional side, and there was something about her that was always going to be kind of uh, a bit much for him. And um. So, no, but he, I don't know about him ripping them out and throwing them into the fire like that. That's me, my invention. But I do know that he did destroy bits of her diaries and letters that he thought w wouldn't um, serve her favourably in the long term in, in posterity's gaze. And, of course, we have to be sorry about that. But, I mean, just a little anecdote here. I went, um, I went up to Shropshire from London to try to, um, is when I was trying to track down some cross family letters, hoping to get some more evidence, close, real evidence about what had happened. And um, I spoke to a Johnny, I visited this Johnny Cross descendant. Um, and she told me that her, I think her aunt had inherited sort of trunks, or maybe her great aunt had inherited trunk full of, trunks full of letters from the Cross family and had chucked out tons of them. So these terrible things, yeah, all these all these letters were just destroyed. But I mean, one thinks of Jane Austen and her sister in the with the best intentions, destroy what one would give to see those letters that she destroyed. Mm. Such a shame. <laughs> no. Yeah. Um I I think the one burning question that we haven't discussed yet mm. is early on both in the 19th century you know George Eliot part of the novel and in the present day I actually was wondering if you were foreshadowing lesbian romances um, and then it shifted and Eliot declared that she couldn't be that intimate with a woman and mm. and, and yet um, from Edith Simcox and Maria Congrove, Cosgrove? Um, Congreve. Congreve. Um, mm. It sounds like they were actually romantically in love with her. Now, I'm, I'm wondering what your thoughts are, like how much of this is verified, how much of this is, you know, and, and if this was a choice that you made in the book or if is this, um, yeah, where did this yeah. come from? Did I completely misread it? No, it didn't at all. I, I think it's an interesting thing. I found myself in the I, I. You see, when when she was this disgraced figure, women avoided her, and I needed to express that dramatically. And and I I know that, for instance, it meant a great deal to her when Barbara Bodichon came all the way to Tenby to stay with her. You know because. A woman was officially risking her reputation if she came and was very mm -hmm. friendly with her. So it meant a lot to her. So, for instance, I, I didn't feel with Barbara um, that, there, I, that the intimacy was ever going to shade into something erotic. With Maria Congreve, um, there's kind of elements. There's elements of... A kind of love, you know. I I don't know that it's actually erotic. The the funny thing is, is that after her death, after George Eliot died, Maria Congreve, as I say in the book, did say to Edith Simcox that she too had loved her darling lover wise. So I think it's clear, Maria mm. Congreve, and that wasn't made up by me. What happened in Lucerne when Maria Congreve sort of loses her cool and can't cope because it meant so much to her to see her again. I I think she was a phenomenally attractive woman in spite of her ugliness. And that's the wonderful thing. She had 
a face, as Henry James said, that then could seem could seem ugly and then could seem strangely beautiful. And her encompassing understanding and humor and sympathy and all the rest of it must have been amazing. And but she obviously had a lot of personal power. So I think and there's no question Edith Simcox was obsessively and erotically in love with her. Um, so I don't know, for instance, I don't know that Edith Simcox had this experience with, with any other woman. In fact, she documents a time when a woman falls in love with her, Edith Simcox, and Edith is not in the least interested. And she sort of bats her away and wonders if, goodness, is this what I felt like to marry and to George Eliot? Um, but you don't but I, fall in love with a set of genitalia. You fall in love with a person. Exactly. And I, I think Edith Simcox was was not, you know, was really erotically and in every possible way in love with George, George Eliot. And I think Maria Congreve was, and I, I think this was something, I came to feel there was something in George Eliot that I, that needed so much to be loved. Um, I think these closenesses mattered enormously to her. And she did let Edith Simcox kiss her feet and, there are Edith Simcox's account of, you know, or Edith Simcox saying, you know, I covered her cheeks and kiss. You know, there's a lot of kissing going on. And um, I don't think it ever became a lesbian romance. And going, but I think that there was, I think she was, I think she loved to be loved is what I felt about Ellis from both men and women, men and women. And I, the scene that you refer to where she brutally pushes um, Simcox away and says, you know, the love for um, the love for men and women must always be taken more seriously than the love between women. I suspect that probably is what she th she thought, and that did happen. That's in is recorded in Simcox's diary, very much verbatim. Um, but I did feel about that 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 was. Um, Maybe because she was going through so much private, strange stuff with Cross, something about the fantastical element in Simcox's love for her, which she had never actually, I, and especially when she had her own private plans now, probably to go ahead with Cross, made her do something quite brutal. I, it sounded to me quite brutal the way she suddenly kind of said, listen, mate, get this straight. I'm not interested in, you know, it's just because after all, there'd been a good long time of, um, it's how I think a lot of the time she also was very moved and, and liked being loved by Simcox. So a bit of I a... Couldn't, I couldn't help but wonder if the um, vilification, the rejection by society that she experienced when she moved in with Luz, I, I wondered if the thought of having a similar relationship with a woman and the utter, utter rejection she would have experienced because of that and, and the destruction of her, potentially the destruction of her career and her influence um, was actually a primary motivator in that. I don't think so, only because I think she really did want, I think she was fundamentally heterosexual. And I, I think she just so wanted, before Lewis came along, she kept falling in love with these guys. <laughs> Often very, in, you know, it, it, it never worked out. They're also brutes to her. And, and, um, and then with Lewis, she had just such, <laughs> A fabulous relationship. I mean, really, it, it's the happiest marriage I've ever read about. Oh, sort of non-legal, ironically, but you know, not a marriage, marriage, but a marriage in effect. Um, but he looked so after her. He supported her. He smoothed the path for her. He did so much for her. And yeah. you know, as much as anything, I mean, I, I feel like this this book is is a love letter to George Eliot, but it's also a love letter to George. I'm so glad you say that because really 
I just, his generosity was just, you know, breathtaking. I, I, I think he's adorable. And also reading his, if you, there were so many gorgeous sort of letters that I couldn't get into that book, unfortunately, because it wouldn't fit with the story. But I mean, Lewis is a wonderful letter writer because it's like he's, you can tell it's like he speaks. It's fantastically spontaneous. And she is a wonderful letter writer, but in a very different way. They're much more sort of, they're conscious. You know, they're, they're more self-conscious. Um, they're also wonderful. They're also wonderful. But, but mm-hmm. his is just like, he'll say things like, to know her was to love her about Elliot. Or, he, he, he's adorable. And um, yeah, yeah. So I'm very glad that it was a love letter to them both. Can I ask, you've, you've yeah. had a history, a career of reviewing books and of mm. editing books. Mm. What was it about, I, and I assume it's partly George Eliot's story, but it's also partly where you're at in life, that gave you the uh, inspiration and the courage to switch from reviewing and editing to actually writing now, but also for this book? I have been really wanting to write fiction for a very long time. And I, um, and I have been, I have been practicing as it were, you know, I think the craft of the novel is much more difficult than is generally acknowledged. I I mean, it's an infinite craft, really. It's each novel have a different will demand something different, I think, which is why it's, <laughs> you can't just learn it as it were. Um, so I've kind of practiced. And then there was her, her story. I, I used to read biographies of her and I was always, there was something about that strange um, bit at the end about this sudden appearance of Johnny Cross and then that strange leap into the canal. It, that, just and then her death so soon afterwards. That seems yeah. suspicious to me, but maybe it's just me. <laughs> I think other people have felt that, actually. Um, I don't, but there are quite a lot of people who do, I, I think. I think the biographer Ina Taylor seemed to feel it was suspicious. But um, but I, I got intrigued really by the idea about her relationship with the public, where I sensed a story, I think, this, that first she could sort of, shock the public but it was really with ultimately in a very kind of moral and romantic way and then I think with Cross it was kind of more difficult because it was almost like an anti-romantic story that was happening and Mm. I think she felt it was a little fast herself but but here I do really feel she became like the subject of one of her own books where she you know to be human is to be unpredictable and flawed and she surprised herself and and I I think there was something in that that felt to me I wanted to understand it not as a, not just as a homage but I wanted to try to make it understandable but, you know this strange thing that could happen in spite of herself in spite of this wonderful long relationship with Lewis and um, for us to sympathize with her along that ride and feel with her I think it took her to difficult places do you do you have a plan for your next book? What what is next for you apart from lots of interviews and the book tour and everything? Yeah, well, I um, there is an there is a novel I've written before that I that needs still more doing to it that I probably will revisit and look at. Um, um, and then there's lots of things that I'm. I'm kind of taking notes and brewing away, but don't yet quite know. I, I am interested in this extraordinary moment of where women are at the moment. Um, it's riveting, but I, I, I'm interested in looking at it in various different angles as well. So, Well, um, can you tell us anything about the, the book you're thinking about um, revisiting or is it too soon to talk about that? It, well, I'll tell you, I'll say one thing about it, which is, is probably very, not, not that, not that illuminating, but about, uh, um, I suppose it's a wife's revenge on a man, on the husband who leaves her. 
that's a, a, that's not necessarily really what it's about, but that's that's the that's the story. That could be a thriller, a horror, a comedy. That could be anything. <laughs> Yeah, well, being me, it won't be a thriller and it won't be a horror. So I suppose I, I want it to be um, kind of rich where people can recognize and feel themselves in it. Um, but but also I want it, I always like a, a reader to have, be carried in, in that enjoyable, ideally swept up way. Almost so, more normal life as it were, not sort of extreme. Mm. Um, the thing about George Eliot, even though she doesn't entirely talk the feminist talk, she did walk the, the feminist walk in terms of her life in this extraordinary, bold um, decision to live openly with a married man. But perhaps most importantly of all, in her work, she really did open things up for women. In her books, Mill on the Floss, Middlemarch, Daniel Deronda in particular, she really explores what what did it mean to be a woman, an intelligent, imaginative woman who desired to do something with her life in the 19th century, and what were those cultural conditions, that, especially in Daniel Deronda, where Gwendolyn is really an, a really deep interrogation of what it meant to be a young, a young woman in the um, sphere of, you know, young ladies becoming accomplished for the purposes of marriage. And where does that really leave you in relation to the world? And it is not a good place. It's a, it's a devastating diagnosis. And so I feel that this is the real counter argument to people who accuse Eliot of, of being conservative. The answer really is in her books. She exposes it all. She doesn't offer solutions, but she exposes the reality. Yeah, she exposes, she exposes the problem. As Chekhov said, you, you show the problem, not the solution, something like that. And I think that's just what she did. Oh, that, that's something that you can just sit with and absorb. And then it's up to us to find our own solutions. Yeah, it is. And I think that's probably not the job of fiction to find the solutions. That's my own personal view. I have loved In Love with George Eliot. And thank you very much for talking to us today. <laughs>